Thank you again for the invitation to join you this morning. I was super happy to not just receive the invitation, but to be able to participate in this work, which I continue to be inspired by. This has become a very fruitful relationship that the Color Conventions Project is, is grateful to be able to um, develop with AMP and with the Philly Writers Project. So as has already been discussed, we're going to be talking about the color conventions movement in the classroom, bringing buried black history to classroom life. So what is a color conventions movement? Though it has been ably introduced by the young woman who spoke just before me in a very, very small nutshell, because I kind of think in some ways, a lot of the people who are present in this meeting know about the color convention movement. Um, so I'm, <clears throat> my intention is just really to give a bit of a gloss and hopefully to encourage you when you have the time to check out our website. So if you're interested in going in more depth, you'll be able to read about it um, on your own. So the color convention movement was a black activist intellectual movement that began in 1830 and continued right until the turn of the century. Um, during this time period, as was mentioned before, um, African Americans formerly enslaved and some who had liberated themselves from enslavement and what's also called unfree in African American history, um, gathered together in African American churches, meeting halls, Freemason, um, organizations to talk about work on create and sustain an articulated call for full black citizenship. So black citizenship included abolition, of course, but it also included access to the ballot box, access to the jury box, fair pay for fair work, access to quality education for African-American children, access to trades, access to unions. So what we consider the civil rights movement, what primary research, particularly starting with the colored conventions movement has demonstrated actually began long before most people have even begin to think that African-Americans were involved in intellectual activism, but not only were we involved, but we have a long history of it. So part of what shifts when you start thinking about and understanding the role and the relevance of the colored conventions movement, which not just started in 1830, which predates um, the abolitionist movement, which was began by white Americans in Philly, which we know the history of, so I'm not going to necessarily go into that right now, but it predates it. It shifts the focus, not just from focusing on the abolition of slavery, but expanding this conception of liberation to include all aspects of being an American citizen, being a part of this nation. Why is this the history that we know, a history that centers the participation and organizational efforts of white people? Because part of what that does is it displaces the agency and subjectivity of African-American and or Black people in the United States. It creates a narrative of what has become known as a white savior narrative, which is not only comfortable, but it allows us when we don't think about the fact that Black people were agitating for full liberation and full participation in American democracy, it allows us to think that African Americans were liberated from slavery by Abraham Lincoln, which of course did not happen fully until 1866, which now that we're thinking about it is two generations and some beyond when African Americans began agitating, organizing, sending petitions to Congress, sending letters to various political organizations, running for political office, printing these full minutes in newspapers and engaging in public discourse, founding Howard Law School, founding Talladega College in Louisiana. It goes on and on and on. And so what we start to understand instead is that the history that we thought we knew is not accurate. So one of the first color conventions that we have an image of is this Nashville convention that took place in 1876. And as you can see um, at the top, way in the back is the president of the convention. You see a gentleman who is addressing the convention. Uh, you see the 
delegates who were seating, uh, seated closer to the front of the podium. And then you see the participants and or the people who were just there to listen and to learn. By date now, we believe that there were thousands of colored conventions. We have proof of thousands of colored conventions that took place starting in 1830 in Philadelphia, going all the way across the United States into Canada. We have documentation of those. We have people attending colored conventions meetings from as far away as Africa, um, Liberia to be precise, um, Liberia, Ghana, Sierra Leone. We have proof of attendance attending from Haiti, from Jamaica, and from Latin America. We do not have proof of meetings that were held in those places, but we suspect that they actually were. And so again, what are the things that were discussed? They were local, they were regional, and they were national. And so literally, if you think of like a black state of the nation, that's the form that the colored conventions took. But what they did in addition to creating a forum for these conversations is it created a way for African-Americans to participate in the, what are called the rituals of democracy in the creation of what is popularly known now as a nation within a nation with leaders, with rules, with, with, with structure and processes. So part of what else interesting about this history that we have learned as a result of doing this primary research and gathering the colored conventions records from all over, literally all over the world, we found records at the Kew Library in London, we found records at historical societies, we found records in people's basements, and we're still actually looking for records. If you go on our website, you'll see um, links for seeking records. So we'll know a convention took place because the proceedings were printed in newspapers, African American newspapers primarily, but also in white newspapers. But we don't always have the records of that convention. Um, very often the records for the entire convention were printed in the paper. And by the records, we mean the president's address, the closing address, descriptions of the topics that were discussed. But for many of them, we only have the advertisement <laughs> for the convention, or we have people discussing the things that happened at the convention, but we don't have what are called the proceedings. But part of what's interesting, again, about the colored convention, of, of the arc of the colored conventions movement, um, is the degree of conventions, which this, um, this screenshot from our, from our website shows, is that the conventions actually gained, started to truly gain momentum after abolition was passed. What that does is it helps to put a fine point on the fact that people were not just interested in abolition, people were interested in full citizenship in the United States. These were African-American concerns that unfortunately should probably sound very familiar. An ongoing discussion, of course, was e-migration. And e-migration talks about the process of people who are native to a country leaving to go to another country. Um, so there was, of course, the well-established route to Canada, which was actually started by the Colored Convention organizers in 1830, which is probably too much for me to get into right now. Um, but later still, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Latin America were places, Jamaica and Trinidad, were places that were actively discussed as options for African Americans to realize full freedom. So what do we do? How do we bring this information and this um, the archive to teachers and to students. We actually have a committee that's dedicated to what is called National Student Access and Engagement. And as a consequence of, consequence of the work of this committee, um, we work with professors, we work with um, college instructors, we work with teachers, we work with individuals who work in libraries or community centers to bring this content into their spaces. These are some of our teaching partners. This is just a screenshot. Um, and all of these people are actually different professors in different states. So if we go now to focus on the high school classroom, which is where my interest and ours lies today, um, we're going to get a little bit more focused. And for the teachers who we are going to have the honor and the pleasure 
of hearing from this morning, this will be a little bit of the behind the scenes. It's going to be some of what you may not have heard. So shortly after joining the Colored Conventions Project, I shared with our co-founder, Dr. Gabrielle Foreman, that I wanted the project to create public school curriculum. Um, the unremembered history of the Colored Conventions movement had not been allowed into classrooms. Um, and I was very, very conscious of this. So I wanted us to figure out a way to bring this information back to the communities that had created this history particularly because the role and relevance of Philadelphia was central to this work. This city is not just the home of the first convention, but the first five conventions, which were all held at Mother Bethel in Philadelphia. Therefore, Philadelphia laid the blueprint of the three generations of Black in intellectual activism, which followed spreading across the United States, Canada, and we suspect on into the continent of Africa. We do not have evidence, as I've said earlier, of this yet, but we're pretty sure we will find evidence of color, con color conventions meetings held wildly across the diaspora. So therefore knowing and teaching about the color conventions movement shifts the conception of everything we think we know about black history. And I really wanted our students to learn and know what this means and why it matters. So the Colored Conventions Project and the Philadelphia School District. I suspect that most of these people look familiar. You'll see Shakita, you'll see Yassine, you'll see Dr. Kim Gallen and myself. Um, Dr. Kim Gallen and I originally conceived of the first curriculum project that we brought to Shakita and Yassine, who embraced the idea and worked with us to create our initial project. So on my team was Dr. Kim Gallen, as I said previously, undergraduates and graduate students who then became part of the curriculum committee. None of them are actually here anymore. Dr. Kim Gallen has moved on and the undergraduates and graduates have actually all graduated and moved on to bigger and better things. But we wanted to create a pilot project that would create the support needed to co-write curriculum with PSD teachers using the archival records of the Colored Conventions Movement as the base and inspiration of the curriculum. As a former classroom teacher, I knew intimately that all sizes don't fit all. <laughs> you actually have to work with people in their spaces to create meaningful content that they could actually utilize. And so we secured a grant and we pursued this work. So we convened the advisory board first, we received their blessings and the work began. So you're going to see and meet more of these exact teachers this morning. We had Janelle Moore Amon, Nick Bernardini, Kazaya, um, and Adam. These were the teachers who agreed to work with us um, as we set about to do this. So again, these were the four teachers, Janelle Moore Amon, Kazaya Ridgway, Nicholas Bernardini, and Adam Sanchez. We worked over a period of a semester. We had regular meetings. We had explicit support from Kita and Yassine. We used principles of Blackboard planning and made sure that the curriculum that we were producing were in alignment with the CCP education principles and the CCP principles. So these teachers are actually here right now and they can describe their experiences and how they implemented the curriculum in their classrooms far better than I ever can. And since this is the best part of today's event, I can't wait to hear more. I do want to take a special moment to recognize Janelle Moore Ahmed. She's not just an outstanding teacher with whom I've had the pleasure to work with on other projects, including a recent presentation that we did as a team, a group of us did as a team at the American Historian Association's yearly meeting this January, where she shared some of her experiences and student work. And it was great. But Janelle has given the project the opportunity to work closely with a PSD teacher as we've explored other aspects of curriculum development. So I very quickly want to talk about the one of the latest big things that we did, which is the revealing of our first Colored Conventions mural. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, we encourage you to do that. It's at 1021 South 4th Street in Philadelphia, PA. It's a two panel mural. The first panel is a 19th century panel. Um, and it's of course on the side of, of uh, it's on the sides of two buildings. So one is like maybe uh, 175 yards away from the second one. So how did we do this? In conjunction with the community who become the guardians of the mural, mural, we had several community paint days, we had food, we had music, we had an educational piece where we had a local art teacher 
in Philadelphia come in and create art projects with community members who then participated in creating the backgrounds for the murals. So people painted on the murals, they put their names, they put details about themselves and their family members, particularly because they're going to become the guardians of the mural. This is important to us. The second panel of the mural is the contemporary panel. On this panel, um, in the very, very center, you see an African-American um, activist whose name is Kendra Vanderwater, who is one of the co-founders of Yeah Philly. Um, she's right in the center. And that's partially as a way to make sure that we not only honored the activism, which started the color conventions movement right here in Philly, but continues to divine and shape our city. So the contemporary panel, of course, has some of the images that we're familiar with from Selma, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd. It's anchored by the agitate, 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 which is one of the most famous sayings of Frederick Douglass, who was considered the lion of the colored conventions movement. And in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see the name of Dolores Green. Dolores Green was one of the organizers of the Southwark Ladies. And the Southwark Ladies are responsible for the community activist work that created the Riverside Apartments. Um, so we wanted to make sure that not only was her name enshrined in the mural, but the through line, which is uh, represented by what they call the, the tear out in the middle of the mural, the through line from the 19th century to the contemporary moment is clear and we hope an inspiration for those who come behind. So just very, very quickly, we have not built this curriculum out yet, but we did create a handout for the community and for anyone else who's interested. And if you go to the website, you'll see it. So these five people who are on the contemporary side and the rest of the places which build us out to 12 are the individuals who are on the 19th century side of the murals. So of course, Bishop Richard Allen, William Still, John Bethon Vachon, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper and William Whipper. So these are some of the leaders, the movers and the shapers of the colored conventions movement. They were all residents and or people who counted Philly as home. Um, some of the, I'm sure all of these names for those of you who are, who are uh, practitioners of African-American history are very, very, are very known to you. And their, fa their faces are now enshrined in this huge, uh, beautiful mural that is in Philly. So hopefully you'll, when you get an opportunity, you can check it out. These are some of the other, these are the other names um, and the other places from Marianne Shad Carey, who we are honoring. She's at the hard right. Uh, Marianne Shad Carey, who we'll be honoring in our upcoming Douglas Day celebration, which I'm going to share very briefly with you about. Jabez Pitts Campbell, Frederick Douglass, of course, Mother Bethel again. Uh, so this was our mural reveal. Uh, we had the pleasure of sharing that day with Shakita and with Ishmael Jimenez, who shared not only words with us, but celebrated the opening, the official reveal or opening of the mural. We had a lot of fun. So to close out, because I don't want to take any more time, and I'm super interested in hearing from the teachers this morning, we are having our annual Douglas Day. And if you've not had a chance or you've not heard about it, we encourage you to go to our website and go to douglasday.org. We are centering the life, work, and legacies and texts of Marianne Shed Carey, who was also on the mural because she was a Delaware native who lived, worked in Delaware and in Philadelphia. Um, in between uh, living in Canada, where she became a booster for Canadian immigration. She founded and was the editor of the Provincial Freeman, one of the first American women to be the editor of a paper, one of the first, not the first, one of the first Black women to do so. She was an activist, she was an educator, she was a suffragette. She was a really remarkable woman and we are actually able to now transcribe her archive, not just the letters and the receipts from her personal archive that we were able to get scanned copies of from archives in Ontario, but we are also transcribing for the first time the almost complete run of the Provincial Freeman newspaper, which is the newspaper that she edited. Um, we got that from the University of Pennsylvania, um, and it promises to be a pretty fun and interesting day. So again, everything is online. Everything is virtual. You can 
go to the website douglasday.org. You can register as yourself, just as an individual who's curious, who wants to participate in transcribing, and or you can register your classroom. Um, your students will be able to transcribe. We have a whole program. Um, we have a cake decorating competition, which is a generous use of the word competition. Um, we have different speakers, we have a panel. So it ends up being generally a fun way to spend Douglas Day, which we say is a way for us to celebrate loving Black history. So without further ado, I want to apologize again for the technical glitch. Thank you for interrupting me uh, so that you could actually see what I prepared. Sorry that you missed the first I don't know, five or six slides. And I hope that this was a good introduction to the rest of what we're about to hear. Thank you again for the invitation.